Okay, hello students, welcome back. We continue this uh, Zoom connection. Hopefully it will continue working okay. If you have any feedback, by the way, of how we can do it better or differently, just uh, sing out, contact Professor Van Bibber or Austin or Mansuk or myself or any combination of us. We're open to any suggestions. So I just have a couple of preliminary remarks. First of all, I've been having office hours Wednesday mornings and not many students have uh, joined. So I'd like to just change it slightly and say, if you want to have office hours with me, next Wednesday, 10.30 to 11.30, send a note to Mansuk and or myself so I'll know to be on. I won't be on unless students say they're going to be there for the office hours, okay? And uh, secondly, the schedule is that we have the simulation today, US, China, North and South Korea. And then uh, next week, we have two sessions on North Korea. Uh, Professor Van Bibber is going to speak on technical issues and Mansuk will begin with some policy discussions and I have a few words to add. And then also, um, sorry, uh, on Wednesday, Mansuk will complete his lecture on North Korea. So that's for the next two weeks. Okay, I turn it over to you Mansuk for the details of the simulation. Can't hear you, Mansuk. Mansuk? Yeah. Can't, can't hear you. Okay. okay. Can, can you hear me? Yes, now I can hear you. Okay. So, uh, as I posted on the big courses, the sequence of the simulation will from North Korea, US, South Korea, and then China. So, each team will present 10 to 30 minutes about their. Uh, negotiation goals and strategies and uh, considerations. And then uh, each, each team will answer questions for five minutes. After that, uh, we'll have uh, the, the open discussions for all our class. Is that clear? So we'll begin with a uh, North Korean team. And uh, please uh, briefly introduce your team, team, you know, uh, team members first, then uh, uh, present to your slides. Hey, man, sir. Yeah. Is it okay? We actually incorporated slight transitions uh, where we introduce each person as they speak progressively. Oh, yeah, it's up to you. Okay, cool. Okay, are we good to go? Good to go. Good luck. Thanks. Can you all see the presentation? Yeah, you're good. Yeah. OK. Hello. I am the president, James Parks, of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. And my delegation and I would like to thank each of you for coming here today. This summit marks a momentous occasion for the Korean Peninsula and for the world. For the DPRK, it may be perhaps the most important turning point in the history of our fair country. Since the turn of the millennia, the DPRK has proved time and time again that we possess the strength, resources, and intelligence to be recognized as a country of influence and deserving of respect in global politics. Despite this, throughout our history, we have been the recipient of, a, uh, of constant international aggression in the forms of sanctions. Uh, even over just the past 20 years, the impact of sanctions on our economy is readily apparent. As can be seen by the bar graph to the right, where the beige bars correspond to negative GDP growth and the blue bars correspond to positive GDP growth, it is readily apparent that there is a strong correlation between the years of increased sanction and those of decreased GDP. Furthermore, the year with the largest growth of GDP, the year 2000, corresponds to a minor relief of sanctions by the US. With this in mind, it is our opinion that the DPRK, uh, that the discrepancies uh, between the DPRK economy and those of the Republic of Korea, as can be seen in the plot to the right, are entirely attributed to the interventions against the DPRK. We can no longer, 
uh, stand to allow these sanctions to devastate our economic potential. It is the opinion of the DPRK that the sanctions placed on us constitute an offense on our country and its people. With that, I would like to turn it over to my Chief of Staff, Christian Scalfani. Thank you, President Parks. Uh, so I've been responsible for organizing the DPRK's research, uh, assisting President Parks with various administrative duties, financial matters, and our organizational organization's operational activities. I've also assisted in coordinating negotiations between our Foreign Minister Pearson and the Republic of Korea's Foreign Minister Vergari, as well as helping to organize the logistics of our proposal today. Next slide, please. It's important to note that amidst the recent COVID-19 outbreak, while other countries suffered both physically and economically, as millions became infected and hundreds of thousands have died, we have proven the safety of our citizens is of the utmost importance, even during times of international strife. Despite the path of destruction the COVID-19 virus has unleashed on many countries, we, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, have avoided the plague due to swift measures which have allowed us to prevent even a single citizen from contracting the disease. According to the United States Central Intelligence Agency, the DPRK has 13.2 hospital beds and 3.6 doctors per thousand citizens, compared to the US having only 2.9 and 2.6 respectively. Still, we recognize the growing risk the virus poses. Thus, we have continued to improve our already well-established medical infrastructure in the event the epidemic breaches our borders. In December 2019, we began construction on a new hospital in downtown Pyongyang, helping to prepare us for the worst possible scenarios because the health and safety of our citizens is what matters to us most. Now I'll hand it off to the chairman of the armed forces, Hugh Simmons. Thank you, Christian. My roles and responsibilities are to share information about military capabilities, offer input about regional partnership with China, advise fellow members about strengths and weaknesses of adversarial nations, and provide information on sanctions against, the, against us, North Korea. Next slide, please. So we have selective interference within the region. If you take a note of this slide, it has uh, sections of India and Pakistan who are both nuclear nations and they've had sanctions placed on them um, in 1998 and then they started lifting sanctions in 2001. I just want to highlight this slide. Next slide please. These actions imposed have affected not only the military but also people's economic prosperity through such actions as China and Russia backed by the United States. China has banned all imports of coal from North Korea, banned exports of some petroleum products and imports of textiles from North Korea. Russia's North Korea's naval vessel, vessels are called into port to be required to undergo inspections. And authorities also, they've also had the authorities be vig ex extra vigilant with the North Korean diplomats. Um, bans on trade and economics, banking, financial, scientific, and technical cooperations within North Korea. This is all through Russia, all supported by the United States. Japan imposes sanctions on North Korea, including banning remittances, prohibiting North Korean citizens from entering Japan, um, even banning North Korean ships entering Japanese ports and extending it to, to include other ships that have visited North Korea. South Korea has banned North Korea ships from South Korean ter territorial waters, uh, suspending trade, inner trade within the Korean Peninsula, um, with the exception of the Kaesan Industrial Zone, and that was later closed, banning most cultural exchanges between North and South Korea. The United States has had, a, had sanctions against North Korea since 1950, from 1950 to today. So these sanctions include um, based on trading with the enemy, not allowing, not allowing trade with the United States and North Korea. Um, these involve minerals and metal trade, trades, which compromise a large part of the North Korean foreign exports. You know, so the United States is cut from its financial systems or freezed assets in many companies, businesses, organizations, and individuals trading in goods, services, and technology with North Korea. Next slide, please. 
I'll be followed by the defense minister. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Chai Pedetti, and I'm the D Minister of Defense for the DPRK. My roles and responsibilities include planning and implementing national retaliatory measures against foreign threats, to strategize defensive measures for possible foreign threats, and to use intelligence to understand opposition offensive capabilities. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as for our uh, defensive capabilities, uh, we have somewhere in the ballpark of 50 uh, nuclear warheads that we are ready to uh, ready to launch at any time. We have a significant stockpile of chemical and biological weapons for more shorter and inter intermediate ranged attacks to deal with our local uh, geographical region. Uh, our nuclear program is a far cry from what it was in the 50s and 60s from its humble beginnings. We are a uh, serious nuclear threat in the world as it stands. We have about an estimated 4 million tons of uranium ore. We do not need to rely on external forces to get a uh, sufficient amount of uranium ore in order to run our nuclear programs. And as I said, we are a far cry from where we were 50 years ago. We have more than uh, the capabilities for a West Coast strike on the US. And in fact, recently we even have confirmed uh, capabilities of an East Coast strike. So we are in fact a very formidable nuclear power. And um, I will turn it over to our uh, sec uh, secretary advisor, Yves. Hi, uh, so my role has been to provide insights and gather information about the international military capabilities and situation, thus helping our uh, delegation to come up with fair and informed negotiations with uh, the other states. Next slide. First, the US is a very strong state. Uh, it, it is a nuclear state with a significant amount of military units and bases in um, Eastern Asia. The US reserved the right to use nuclear weapons as first strikers and if necessary. And the latest nuclear posture review makes us believe the possible use of low yield nuclear weapons in regional conflicts. Now, China is also a nuclear state, but in a very different situation than the US. First, even if the country has weapons and uh, if North Korea uh, is located within the range of SRBMs, they claim not to be first users. Then our relations with China are good overall as the DPRK is geographical and political buffer between them and the American allies. And the THAAD uh, crisis where South Korea installed in 2017 an anti-ballistic system worried the Chinese viewing it as an extension of the US strategic interests, and which is very good news for our delegation. Lastly, th South Koreans uh, don't have nuclear weapons, but have uh, the possibility to develop it quickly as they have both the equipment and the material to do it. The country has one of the strongest armies in the world, which is not uh, negligible and have a very important military cooperation with the US. Those information and our capabilities made us believe that the DPRK's military power and the advantageous uh, relations that we have with China give us enough weight to be able to negotiate on the international scene. South Korea's link with the US is problematic for both for us and China. Therefore, the main challenge that we have to face is the US. This motivates us to want to decrease or even remove the American presence in South Korea and strengthen the relations with China. Uh, next slide. So now I will let uh, Tatiana Ferras, uh, the Director of National Intelligence, speak. Hello, my name is Tatiana Ferras, and I'm the Director of the National Intelligence of the DPRK. My aim was to gain valuable inside information and provide that information to the President, to President Parks and the Foreign Minister Pearson about the other delegation's interests their strategy, possible talks and agreements that they have been discussing with other delegations before the summit or that we would like to uh, complete during this summit. Providing this advanced knowledge about all delegations improve our position in the nego negotiations since we are better prepared about what to expect from our counterparts. DPRK's, uh, sorry, next slide. DPRK has recently in 2019 reinforced the National Intelligence Agency and still advances it. Although we cannot release our exact methodology, we, can, we use non-conventional sources of collection of classified information, and we use that for our interests. It is clear that foreign intelligence agencies have been not been able to, cl to get classified information from our activities, and this can be shown from the misjudgment and miscalculations of our nuclear and other technological capabilities. 
Inside information suggests that the U.S. delegation has pressured South Korea delegation for an agreement prior to this summit. The U.S. clearly wants to destabilize the Pacific region by trying to sign this agreement with South Korea and also maybe include China. As the Foreign Minister Pearson will inform you in a moment, this agreement be proposed to South Korea aimed for the exchange of more classified information. Now I'm heading to Foreign Minister Pearson. Hi, my name is Foreign Minister Aidan Scott Pearson. My role was to conduct negotiations with the other foreign ministers to coordinate with President Parks and our Director of National Intelligence, Tatiana Sierra Affairs, to better understand our posture and to work to create and finalize agreements with the other delegations. Next slide. Uh, the acceptable negotiating sessions for the DPRK. The DPRK had all these proposals when negotiating with each foreign partners. Our concessions would have involved serious arms reductions to no more than 20 nuclear warheads on short, medium, and SSBN mounted missiles. These reductions would occur over a 15-year period and involved major concessions such as allowing a Republic of Korea inspectors into the DPRK and a freezing on testing along with ending the current war that has not been resolved by either party. We were also willing to look at reductions in long-range ballistic missiles with the United States. We believe that these would be favorable concessions that would yield desired results, but instead they were unilaterally rebuffed in different ways. Here is the overall circumstances with each negotiation. The DPRK entered good faith in negotiations immediately with the Republic of Korea to attempt to normalize relations with them. We offered the modernization and optimization of national strategies for helping integrate new exchanges, moonshine agreement, which roughly adhered to the concessions outlined on the previous slide and would officially have put an end to the Korean War in exchange for a resumption of trade. The Republic of Korea was unable to complete the agreement in a timely manner since there was concerns over wording. Even when the DPRK was prepared to surrender large concessions in the interest of peace, there was interest in going even further. It was difficult to see how this would be completed in a timely manner. Next slide. The DPRK contacted the American de de delegation quickly to establish an open chain of communication. Instead, we received accusations that we were spies. The Americans also refused to discuss a long-term arms reduction agreement, stating that they wanted to focus on denuclearization. We also offered reductions in long-range ballistic missiles, and they refused to our great astonishment. We therefore believe that the Americans are itching for an armed conflict to prop up a failing administration. They also stated that they believed it would be necessary for the agreement to occur in a short time period. This leads us to believe that they were attempting to circumvent short failings in their own political system. When we maintained that we wanted a slightly longer agreement, they accused us of attempting to take advantage of them. It seems that the United States recognizes that their inter international diplomacy and political system are too unstable to enter a Okay, excuse me. Mm -hmm. Time's up. Uh, can you finish in 10 or 20 seconds? Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. And uh, finally, we entered an agreement with our Chinese partners, uh, which was the strength agreement. This agreement laid out that any offense to the DPRK would be viewed as an offense to the Chinese and so forth. And we also agreed that economic sanctions were an offense. I'll turn it over to the president of the DPRK. Um, just as a final uh, conclusion, uh, our goals for this uh, summit are to end the sanctions uh, and keep some nuclear capabilities that we recognize that for international security, uh, some concessions on how much nuclear arms we have may be necessary. Uh, uh, we also uh, want to uh, emphatically state that uh, we uh, will declare any sanctions uh, that are remaining against the uh, DPRK to be an official offense against us and will be forced re to respond accordingly if they are not accounted for. Thank you. Okay. D does Team USA just like automatically go? Should I start sharing my screen? Okay. 
I think the U.S. should follow up next. Okay, I'll just start. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, we couldn't hear you before. She asked if they should start, so I told her to start. U.S. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, so, uh, yeah, other teams uh, ask questions or uh, say critics. Okay, so I'll, I should wait. <laughs> okay, <laughs> go ahead. Sorry. The U.S. team should present its slides next. No questions, comments, or critics to the North Korean team? I have a question for the North Korean. Okay, go ahead. The sanctions against India and Pakistan related to nuclear issues were lifted in 2001 as a result of their joining the Non-Proliferation Treaty and accepting inspections on the civilian nuclear industry. Is North Korea prepared to do the same? Sorry, could you uh, oh, oh, quick correction. It was actually only India that uh, fell under that. I think Pakistan was removed from all sanctions because of uh, India putting them in front of the fight for terror around that time. So I think that civilian and uh, military uh, separation of the nuclear field only happened with India. But. Okay, Professor Nock and Bieber, uh may we start uh, uh, U.S. Yes, presentation? I have the U.S. Ready to go. presentation next. Okay, US team, you're good to okay. go. We'll, we'll take it away, thank you. Um, oh, is it not working? Okay, uh, so hello everyone. Um, so first, just a brief disclaimer to our slide. We uh, just wanted to make it clear that any sensitive issues that would be part of back negotiations are just being pre presented up front in this presentation which isn't really realistic, but that's what we're doing. So anything that was con would be considered a back channel negotiation is italicized and presented in the color you see here, like a magenta. So hello everyone, welcome to the summit. I am Clara, the president of the United States, and I will allow my delegation to introduce themselves as negotiations proceed. North Korea has remained a persistent threat to the US and its allies. North Korea has made advances across several domains, including nuclear weapons, long-range missiles, submarine-based missiles, and short-range artillery. These capabilities make it not only a threat to U.S. interests in East Asia, but to the U.S. homeland. North Korea's threatening behavior consisting of the development of illicit nuclear capabilities and proliferation has made these negotiations unavoidable. We recognize that any negotiations revolving around North Korea's nuclear weapons plan will influence U.S. relations with all other major powers in the area, particularly China and South Korea, which is why these powers have been invited to this negotiation. As you will see when we present our overall strategy, any U.S. policy placing economic and diplomatic pressures on North Korea depends heavily on China backing us as they are one of North Korea's largest trading partners and as a main U.S. ally and the target of small-scale attacks by North Korea, South Korea is at the summit to weigh in on the discussion. Our new negotiation strategy in its simplest form involves complete denuclearization from North Korea within, established, within an established time frame that will be presented later. In exchange for this, the U.S. will adjust sanctions against North Korea. I leave it to the rest of my team to lay out the U.S. strategy in full, the Director of National Intelligence, Sam, will now continue. Hi, I'm Sam Harashute, uh, Director of Intelligence. And uh, as part of my role, I was uh, supposed to look into considerations and motivations uh, for the other countries entering the negotiating table here. Uh, so I'll start with North Korea's considerations. Um, one of their chief considerations is their defense in the region and uh, a crucial part of their defense has historically or has been uh, using nuclear weapons for deterrence and one of america's goals in uh, in this agreement is to ensure denuclearization and it was stated from north korea when we met with them that they prefer a longer time frame as opposed to a shorter time frame 
uh, for denuclearization. Uh, and another uh, motivation we see from North Korea is one of economic pr prosperity, which um, would ride a lot on reducing sanctions because North Korea is heavily sanctioned. Um, up until the presentation we just saw, we had suspected, although not confirmed, that coronavirus assistance would be a priority of North Korea's right now, uh, given the pandemic going on and um, it, given North Korea's problems with medical care, including but not limited to tuberculosis, hep B outbreaks, lower life expectancy, lower heights due to famine. We had expected that to be a problem here, but apparently it isn't. Um, another uh, motivation of uh, North Korea, particularly leadership, is to ensure a continued power within the regime, which could uh, complicate reunification, um, which is something that may be a priority down the road, especially for US and uh, South Korea interests. Uh, next slide, please. All right, all right. sorry, my computer's slow here. Okay, so uh, as far as China's considerations and motivations, uh, North Korea has been somewhat of a problem child, uh, uh, kind of a pain in China's backs uh, with regards to uh, raising the potential of China to be involved in war with uh, US and uh, South Korea. Um, and if, if, South, uh, if North Korea were to collapse, um, this would mean a flood of refugees from North Korea into China, which is something that China would prefer uh, not to have to deal with. Um, China has a pivotal role as North Korea's uh, almost only economic lifeline and China would be likely staunchly opposed to reunification of the Koreas because it would mean having a um, US troops on its land border. Next slide, please. So as far as South Korean uh, considerations, motivations here, uh, the immediate goal of South Korea, we uh, interpreted and also followed up and confirmed with South Korea is that they're looking for uh, denuclearization, ceasing of nuclear tests, um, with a long-term goal here um, of reunification. Notice that that's in magenta and italicized here because this is obviously not something we'd be saying at a negotiating table in real life. Um, and uh, kind of reiterating the earlier point about coronavirus, we were expecting that South Korea would uh, have motivation of providing humanitarian aid toward uh, the new North Korean people. Thanks. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Andrew Dong. All right. Hello, everyone. This is Andrew. I am the National Security Advisor of the United States. So going on to U.S. considerations, this is a clear tipping point, both in terms of North Korea's nuclear aspirations, as well as U.S.'s willing negotiation options. So it's been almost 30 years, um, starting from the 1994 agreed framework or even before, of essentially the same negotiation strategy happening on both sides. It's always been some sort of pause nuclear in exchange of economic and diplomatic concessions. Every single time throughout these past 30 years, North Korea has continually escalated and de-escalated, baiting and switching regarding both military's posturing as well as whatever they list as their desires and needs. And oftentimes these negotiation times uh, happen during times of struggle within the nation slash regime. So currently we have determined that the two main goals right now for North Korea are regarding economic reinvigoration and security guarantees. And also in addition, there may be added complexities due to the coronavirus pandemic occurring right now. So on the bottom, you see a plot of just examples of snapshots of different agreements that were made followed by North Korean unilateral breaking of said agreements causing to reinstallation of sanctions that are not just you know, unilateral sanctions by the United States, but especially, for example, in 2017, multilateral sanctions through the United Nations. All right, next slide. So the US standpoint is to do whatever is necessary to prevent a new slash prolonged nuclear weapons state. So most likely, most of the nuclear, uh, most if not all the nuclear weapons states currently in existence do not want a new nuclear state. North Korea has already been known as a proliferator of weapons, at least conventional. They've had dealings within countries in the Middle East, Africa, Southeast Asia, and Cuba. Uh, 
and as well as other countries. Many of these dealings are also going through Chinese intermediaries, which is something to be discussed, especially within China. Um, using inspiration from the JCPOA, there is also things that we're going to be considering in terms of our negotiating options. So first is an inclusion of some sort of international arbitration enforcement body. Um, this will be allowing for potentially uh, the ability to modify the agreement online with potential extensions or things of those nature, uh, adding in redundancy uh, options, as in multi multi-pronged approaches to making sure denuclearization happens, as well as quote leaving the military option on the table. And then regarding differences from the GCPOA, we cannot just copy paste the Iran nuclear deal for one for North Korea, in that one Iran did not have a complete nuclear weapons yet. And two, North Korea is already testing nuclear weapons, meaning that the timelines of sanctions of leave and overall agreements cannot be the same. Now with that, I will uh, turn it over to Secretary of Defense. All right. Um, so the United States overall strategy uh, going into these talks is one of proportional responses for proportional actions. Concessions made by the DPRK will be met by proportional concessions from the United States. The second key point is that a threat to an ally is a threat to the United States, as South Korea and Japan are in range of most, if not all, DPRK missiles. The United States will treat short or long range missiles uh, as the same. Lastly, the DPRK has repeatedly used its nuclear arsenal as a way of forcing certain concessions from the United States and other nations. This behavior will not be allowed to continue. Any failure of a de denuclearization agreement will likely result in US military strikes designed to cripple North Korea's nuclear capabilities. Next slide. Uh, the thermonuclear test and ICBM launched over Japan is a clear threat of offensive nuclear war, and as such, will require immediate action and attention. Because of the delay between uh, these recent events and the summit, the United States will immediately enact the following actions to increase sanctions against the DPRK and resume joint military exercises between, uh, with Japan and, North, or, and South Korea. Next slide. Uh, the United States end goal for this summit is to provide full sanctions relief and security of the DPRK in exchange for complete denuclearization. To accomplish this, the United States hopes to put in place a long-term comprehensive, verifiable, uh, irreverse, irreversible uh, denuclearization plan. While the exact details of this plan are up to debate, the following points will be insisted upon. Multilateral international verification regimes, including both safeguards and inspection, a 10-year timeline with the possibility of extension and the ability to withdraw from the agreement. Uh, and with this, I will turn it over to our next person. Hello, I am Richie, the Secretary of State. So we have proposed a timeline um, for this deal with North Korea. The end goal is the complete denuclearization of North Korea. So immediately, if they accept this treaty, they must cease all nuclear weapons testing and the US will guarantee their security. We will also provide partial sanctions relief, relieving some sanctions that have been placed on Korea throughout the years. And we will work with the UN to roll back any sanctions that were placed as a response to the July thermonuclear test. Uh, next slide, please. So in the first five years, we expect North Korea to remove 50% of its nuclear weapons and the stockpile related to any nuclear weapon development. The US will work alone and with the UN to further reduce sanctions, uh, including those on trade, which will help the uh, North Korean economy. And at the seven year mark, we give North Korea the option to renegotiate the treaty to extend it to 15 years, which will look something similar like in the next slide, please. Like this. So over the 15 years, they still need to denuclearize and we will require them to agree to further demands, but they get to keep their nuclear weapons for a greater amount of time. So as seen here, a uh, 15 year proposed timeline will have their nuclear weapons uh, at a greater amount than for a longer period. Next time, next. Uh, the end goal here, uh, once North Korea has completely denuclearized, 
the U.S. will end all military exercises and pull most of its troops away from South Korea. Uh, we will work with the UN once again to reduce uh, economic sanctions placed on North Korea. And with that, I'll pass it over. Uh, you guys are at time, so ben if you could wrap up in like 10 to 20 seconds. Good afternoon, I'm Ben Hicks, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So we see any failure of the agreement after in place, immediately we re-implement sanctions consistent with the violation. Continuing Continuous delinquency involves more real re-implementation of previously rolled back sanctions and potentially more. And any reversal of the agreement re-implements all sanctions, additional sanctions and other measures we the United States see fit. Uh, next slide. We're strongly considering an increased unilateral and multilateral sanctions um, for failures of discussion or the summit. And if we see continue threats by North Korea's military, we will consider military action. Jessica Elder, Chief of Staff. As a summary, uh, North Korea's recent testings have made this negotiation absolutely necessary. We believe our proposed plan is fully achievable, but only through the cooperation of each country in attendance today. And we'd like to emphasize that although we understand North Korea's goal of using nuclear weapons as a deterrent, we believe that if the measures we have outlined are taken, such as providing aid and rolling back sanctions, a higher level of trust can be established between all parties and this method of deterrence won't be necessary. Um, shown on our screen is a brief outline of the steps we believe are necessary to achieve this. We'd like to note that although the US would prefer a timeline of five to 10 years to minimize prolonging of weapon state, we recognize the legitimacy of North Korea's security concerns and we have therefore proposed a possible extension of the timeline to 15 years, but only after all parties have been shown to be acting in good faith. And we believe that by providing concessions proportionally, the outcomes of the agreement will be favorable to every party involved. And we would now finally like to open the discussion up to any questions. I have a question. All right. Uh, my question is, is that most nuclear states uh, around the world have a small arsenal of 20 to 50 nuclear warheads. Uh, why in particular is North Korea being targeted for complete denuclearization when we are willing to already extend major arms reductions? And on top of that, uh, why is the United States considering military strikes when they are stating that they are concerned about North Korea's military uh, maneuvers? So I'd like to note that we are not primarily concerning, uh, considering military strikes. That would be more of a um, method if our negotiation did not come to fruition at all. And we really do believe in the complete denuclearization of North Korea eventually, because it along that way, they would also be provided with sanctions, which would be in all parties' best interests. Excuse me, this is Michael Nacht. Could each person identify themselves, both their name and their role before speaking? Thank you. Um, I, this is Joe, president of uh, the DPRK. I also have a follow-up question. I was just wondering how uh, the DPRK is supposed to uh, trust that the U.S. will actually pro uh, uh, protect them when the relationship between the DPRK and the U.S. has been uh, strained for so long and allies of the U.S., long allies, in fact, such as France, did not believe such uh, protection was uh, viable and so felt the need to develop their own nuclear arsenal. Uh, what is, I, I misunderstood your um, line. Uh, can you rephrase the beginning of the question in terms of what context are you talking about regarding protection? I'm wondering how we're supposed to be able to trust the long-term protection of the U.S. of the DPRK when our uh, relationship has been so rocky in the past, uh, when historically 
as the U.S. Uh, has allies of the U.S., longstanding allies, in fact, such as France, not in uh, the U.S. protection. All right, so I'll answer this question. This is Andrew, the nuclear security advisor. Um, the security guarantee is not that the United States is necessarily protecting North Korea regarding whatever happens. It's more of a, we are ensuring that the United States will not be actively trying to destroy North Korea or something along those lines, right? But regarding that security guarantee, within the past 30 years of North Korea trying to develop nuclear weapons, North Korea has not been attacked. So therefore, the fact that North Korea has a nuclear weapon now does not mean that the security guarantee all of a sudden is magically there. Because in the past 30 years, North Korea has not been attacked. So from our standpoint, North Korea having a nuclear weapon is not key to their deterrence or key to their national security in terms of security guarantee, if that makes any sense. Thank you. OK, uh, then we'll move it to South Korean team. OK, I'm going to. So basically, I give you 13 minutes. And uh, uh, if you have more slides, uh, then I'll give you two more minutes than a uh, total of 15 minutes. OK? Sounds good. Sorry. OK. So hello, my name is Ravadi Tate. I am the president of the Republic of Korea. Today I am joined by my foreign minister, Bergari, defense minister, Vo, national security advisor, Wallace, director of national intelligence, Waller, and ROK armed forces chairman, Williams. Today, along with members of my administration, I am privileged to present our background research and negotiation goals in light of recent nuclear actions by the DPRK. We have also developed what we consider to be a balanced and viable agreement that suits all parties involved. In the interest of time, individual contributions are listed at the end of the presentation. So our overall mission statement is that we would like to renormalize the diplomatic and economic relationship between the Republic of Korea, hereby referred to as ROK, and the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, DPRK, by restoring the regional military balance. Our primary negotiation goals include a nuclear test ban of the DPRK, effective immediately, as well as yearly percentage-based reduction of specific nuclear warheads in exchange for medical support in light of the COVID-19 crisis, economic cooperation, and investment in the DPRK. So a few reasons as to why we should negotiate today include military considerations, diplomatic considerations, as well as economic and sanction considerations. So for military considerations, we looked at what capabilities the ROK has in comparison to the DPRK, the US and China, and how military support might be elevated or exacerbated depending on strategy. For diplomatic considerations, we looked at geopolitical relationships between the ROK and all other players and how we might reach an agreement that accommodates each party's baseline ask. And with economic considerations, we looked at current sanctions placed on the DPRK by South Korea, China, and the US, and how to use the upholding of sanctions or the lifting of sanctions as leverage in coming to an agreement. I will turn it over to Defense Minister Vo to go into military capabilities. Hi, uh, my name is Vo. Um, so based on our research, the conventional militaries of South Korea is superior, far superior than North Korea. Um, in 2014, South Korea spent about 44 times than North Korea in military. So this table shows the breakdowns of the numbers of the forces. So at the first glance, you can see that North Korea are greater in numbers. And the biggest difference is that is in the army and the air force. So you can see that um, uh, North Korea prioritized their forces on offensive force, like greater, much greater number of troops, uh, ships, uh, submarines, and multiple launch rocket systems. And these are for like potential massive invasions of South Korea. In contrast, uh, South Korea spends uh, its forces or resources on defense force, such as armor vehicles, tanks, uh, surveillance and control aircraft, cannons, and helicopters. Um, uh, next slide. 
Um, however, although North Korea have greater in numbers, but if you look at the uh, capability of each models of each of the weapons, you can see that these models are far superior in speed, range, weapon fire control system, and armament. And also half of North Korea major weapons imported from the former Soviet Union during the 50s and the 60s. So in short, um, conventional forces, we are far superior, but the main issue is the nuclear forces of North Korea. So I'll pass it over to Max. Next slide. Hello, I'm Max Wallace, the National Security Advisor for South Korea. And essentially, this slide is going to review what we have already learned from the DPRK in that their nuclear deterrence is not necessarily limited to a war scenario on the Korean Peninsula, but also extends to power projection to our allies in the US and elsewhere. And so it, the result of the ballistic missile test is to unstabilize the region and to bring more focus on the fact that they are actively developing these systems. Next slide, please. But lastly, it wouldn't be honest of me to not illustrate the short-term scenario that South Korea lives in, in that the massed artillery, short-range ballistic missile systems, and multiple rocket launch systems on the DMZ are in an excellent position to threaten Seoul and heavily populated areas of South Korea with little to no warning. And I should illustrate here that just Monday, North Korea tested four short-range cruise missiles and also an air-to-surface missile in a fighter jet launch, which unfortunately didn't make the news because of various corona reasons. Next slide, please. This is Chairman of the Armed Forces, Haley. Um, the Republic of Korea has no intention to develop nuclear weapons, although it may be well within our technological means. Uh, we just want to iterate that this, reiterate that this posture is clear for a number of ideological and practical reasons. Um, it's further supported by agreements with our allies in the function of extended deterrence and taking into consideration that 40% of our energy comes from nuclear power and half of our economy is based on imports. We rely heavily on fuel imports from the US and Canada and have no intention of misusing uh, this critical energy source. So overall, nuclear weapons come with high risks and high costs and we have no need of facing severe sanctions from the international community and envision a nuclear-free Korean Peninsula. And we hope this works uh, we hope to work towards this diplomacy by the agreements discussed with the parties president, present today. And on to our foreign minister, Lorenzo. Thank you. This is Foreign Minister Bergari. And uh, I wanted to point out that the strategy for negotiation we will lead today uh, is very uh, due to the international relationship we have with all the other parties that needs to be involved in the negotiation. In particular, with the DPRK, we had a troublesome relationship in the last 20 years. However, uh, there's been the potential for reconciliation and cooperation between these two countries, most importantly, uh, with, until 2016. And an example of that is the Kaisang Industrial Region. That is an industrial region at the boundary between our two countries, where uh, 124 companies of South Korea went to operate, uh, employing uh, North Korean employees um, with substantial benefits from on the perspective of duties and tariffs. So supporting the development of the DPRK economic uh, status. And we'd like to point out that 30% of DPRK trade at the moment is with Republic of Korea. Uh, at the same time, we have a very strong relationship on an economic, cultural and historical basis with the United States. And we have been defined one of the America, America's closest allies and greatest friends. And we believe that uh, the United States and the United States have a strong military presence in the Republic of Korea with 29,000 troops stationed there. Finally, with China, we have a strong economical and political relationship that has been renormalized in 2017 after we had some uh, clashes due to the uh, ABM's deployment. And we believe that in the future, we will be able to leverage more this, uh, this, uh, re this relationship. Uh, in terms of strategy, we believe that what's important for us to speak uh, with all parties beforehand this negotiation. And I add, can you go to the next slide, please? 
Okay, thanks. And I personally was in touch with North Korean uh, foreign ministers to discuss a potential agreement that could satisfy both countries. We put clearly that the importance for South Korea was to freeze testing, reduce the weapons, and achieve and set the goal for normalization and complete removal of all weapons. DPRK proposed us an initial agreement that we believe to be ineffective because it only banned tests of supercritical materials and allowed the possibility of, as, of adding testing for missile technology. A lot of discussions with North Korea, however, uh, also leveraging the positions of the United States the diplomacy, diplomacy team, show that there has been convergence on the objectives, and we will discuss that later. Uh, we will discuss that later. Thank you. Next. Hello, I'm Director of National Intelligence Waller, and to keep it brief, our discussions with the United States focused on early frequency.